Hello, dear friends. As a continuation of our series of applied neuroanatomy, today we are going to discuss the anatomy of the lateral ventricle. As you know, we have two lateral ventricles, each present in the central part of each cerebral hemisphere. The lateral ventricle is connected by the interventricular foramen of Monroe with the third ventricle, which in turn is connected via the aqueduct of Sylvius to the fourth ventricle, connected together. Also, the lateral ventricle has different parts or holes. Frontally, anteriorly, is the frontal hole, and it ends at the level of the interventricular foramen of Monroe. The continuation is the body of the lateral ventricle, and posteriorly, there is the occipital hole of the lateral ventricle in the occipital lobe, Inferiorly, there is the temporal horn in the temporal lobe. The point of junction between the body, the occipital horn, and the temporal horn is called the atrium of the lateral ventricle or the trigone of the lateral ventricle. This is another view showing the two ventricles and their connections. It is C-shaped with an occipital horn. So this is the frontal horn, the body, the occipital horn, the temporal horn, and here is the atrium of the lateral ventricle. Another view, frontal horn, body, atrium, occipital horn, temporal horn. The temporal horn is called the inferior horn, and the occipital horn is called the posterior horn, and be called. This is a superior view of both lateral ventricles, showing that they are C-shaped, connected uh, to each other via the atrium with a tail. So this is the right and this is the left uh, lateral ventricle. We see also that the choroid plexus is extending from the temporal hole up to the body through the foramen of Monroe to the roof of the third ventricle. Uh, of course, the aqueduct has no choroid plexus and there is a separate choroid plexus in the roof of the fourth ventricle. And from this view, you can see that the two parts of the lateral ventricle devoid of choroid plexus are the frontal horn and the occipital horn. The anatomy of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle, the, it has a roof which is made by the body of the corpus callosum. It has an anterior wall which is the genou of the corpus callosum. It has a floor formed of the rostrum of the corpus callosum a lateral wall formed by the head of the caudate nucleus and the medial wall formed by the septum pellucidum. So the corpus callosum forms the roof, the anterior wall, and the floor of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. Laterally, there is the head of the caudate, and medially, there is the septum pellucidum. This is a nice view on the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere, showing the frontal horn. You can find here that the roof is made by the body of the corpus callosum, the anterior wall by the genou of the corpus callosum, and the floor by the rostrum of the corpus callosum. This is another view showing the same thing, body, genou, rostrum, and medially there is a septum pellucida. Another view also, body, genou, rostrum. Coronal cut showing that the caudate is lying in the lateral wall, in the lateral part of the frontal hole, and medially there is the septum pellucidum. And here we look from the medial surface of the cerebral hemisphere, and we can see that the lateral wall, there is a bulge in the lateral wall, which is made by the head of the caudate nucleus. So we are removing the septum pellucidum, and we can look from the medial part, we see laterally is the head of the caudate. The body of the lateral ventricle, which is the continuation of the frontal hole, posterior continuation, also the roof is made by the body of the corpus callosum, the floor is made by the thalamus medially, and the body of the caudate nucleus laterally. In between, there is the thalamus striate vein and the stria terminalis, which is going from the roof of the temporal horn from the amygdala on its way to the septal nuclei. The medial wall 
of the body is also made of the septum pellucidum above and the body of the fornix below. This is a superior view where you can see the floor of the body and medially there is the thalamus, thalamus here and here. Laterally, there is the head of, or there is the body of the caudate nucleus. More clear view. So this is the thalamus, the body of the caudate nucleus, thalamus striate vein, and the stria terminalis going with the thalamus striate vein from the amygdala on its way to the septal nuclei. And posteriorly, you find on the roof of the third ventricle, which is the floor of the frontal horn, posteriorly, you can find uh, the pineal gland and two structures on either side of the pineal gland called the habenular nuclei, and they are connected together with the habenular commission. Commissure. The floor of the body of the lateral ventricle, as we saw, is made medially by the thalamus. Above the thalamus, there are two layers of pia meter called superior and inferior layers of telacoroidae. Between these two layers lies the internal cerebral veins and the medial posterior choroidal arteries. The superior layer of telacoroidae, which is made of pia meter, goes posteriorly and runs superiorly to line the splenium of the corpus callosum, and the inferior layer runs posteriorly, it runs inferiorly to line the tectum of the midbrain and reaching a space in the subarachnoid space called the cisterna villi interpositus. And so you find here that the roof of the thalamus, the roof of the third, which is the floor of the body of the lateral ventricle, there are two layers of telacoroidae. One superior layer is lining the splenium going above, and the inferior layer is lining the tectum going below, and they're opening into the cisterna villi interpositus, and this space is called the velum interpositus. Another view of the velum interpositus, you can see the velum here. This is the superior layer of telacoroidae. Under it is the internal cerebral veins, and you will find also the medial posterior choroidal arteries. And over the body of the lateral ventricle, <coughs> there is the thalamus, as we said, and lateral to it is the caudate. And the choroid plexus is fixed to the body of the lateral ventricle, as we'll see now. So if you open the lateral ventricle and you try to pull on the choroid plexus, you cannot take it out because it is attached to the floor of the body of the temporal hole which is the roof of the third ventricle, and we'll see how. Another nice view where you can see here the, the thalamus medially and the caudate laterally and the choroid plexus. Here, also on the roof of the thalamus, there is a structure, longitudinal structure, going from the habenal nuclei to the septal region called the stria medullaris thalami. Stria medullaris thalami is a structure on the roof of the third ventricle, the roof of the thalamus, which is the floor of the body of the temporal hole, connecting the habenal nuclei with the septal nuclei, carrying afferents to the habenal nuclei, and they are somehow involved, uh, causing a relation between smell and salivation. When uh, you smell the tasty food, uh, you start salivating. And you see here that the choroid plexus is present and fixed to the floor of the body of the lateral ventricle, and it is coming from the temporal hole. The choroid plexus actually is a highly organized vascular tissue that lines all the ventricles except, as we saw now, the frontal hole and the occipital hole. They have no choroid plexus, and of course the aqueduct. It resides, it is present under the pia meter of the floor of the lateral ventricle and the roof of the third and the fourth ventricle. So this is where the choroid plexus is present. It is attached to the body of the lateral ventricle by pia meter, attaching it to the thalamus laterally, called tinea choroide, and the fornix medially called tinea fornices, or tinea fimbri. So there is an attachment of the choroid plexus to the body of the lateral ventricle, 
by two layers of PA meter, one here is the view, you can see that the body of the lateral ventricle, the roof is made of the corpus callosum, the medial wall is made of the septum pellucidum, and the roof of the, the body of uh, the floor of the body, which is the roof of the third ventricle, we have the two fornices, and below them you find the superior layer of telacoroide and the inferior layer of telacoroide, and they contain two arteries here, the medial posterior choroidal arteries, and two veins laterally, which are the internal cerebral veins, two important deep veins, and here is the choroid plexus in the roof of the third ventricle. If you look to the choroid plexus, you find that it is attached laterally to the thalamus by what we call the tinea thalami, and it is attached medially by another layer of perimeter called the tinea fornices. So that's how the choroid plexus is fixed to the body of the lateral ventricle, laterally tinea thalami, medially tinea fornices. This is attached to the thalamus and this is attached to the fornix. The temporal horn, the temporal horn has got a roof which is made of the amygdala, the tail of the caudate, which is arising from the amygdala on its way <coughs> to the, uh, form the body and then the head of the caudate, and there is the stria terminalis, which is connecting the amygdala to the septal nuclei. So the roof is made of the amygdala, and two structures arising from the amygdala, the tail of the caudate and the stria terminalis. This is going to join the putamen anteriorly, and this is joining the septal nuclei. The floor, we find the floor of the temporal horn, the hippocampus medially, with the fimbria of the hippocampus and the collateral eminence laterally, as we'll see now, and the lateral wall is made of the tapetum of the corpus callosum. This is a coronal cut showing the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles, and this is a view from above showing the temporal horn, showing the floor of the temporal horn. As, as we see here, there is an elevation in the floor of the temporal horn, which is the hippocampus, and lateral to it, there is another elevation called the collateral eminence, which is formed by the collateral sulcus, which is present on the inferior surface of the temporal lobe, and the hippocampus will form the fornices, the crury of the fornix, which will connect together, forming the body of the fornix. So this is the fimbria, and then they form the body of the fornix. Another nice view showing the temporal horn and the hippocampus in the floor of the temporal horn and the collateral eminence in the lateral part of the floor of the temporal horn, and this is in the medial part. This is a diagram showing that the fornices will pass forming the crury, the body, and the columns, which will end into the mammillary bodies coming from the hippocampus, and also the amygdala is present in the roof, as we said before. So another view of the floor of the temporal hall, where you can see the hippocampus, and there is another bulge in the medial wall of the occipital horn, which is the calcar avis, which is nothing but a bulge from the calcarine sulcus on the medial surface of the occipital lobe. Uh, this is a view of the temporal horn, coronal cut, to remind you that the hippocampus occupies the floor of the temporal horn. Uh, this is uh, discussed in detail in the limbic system, and it forms the fimbria, and there is the choroid plexus here, and Laterally, in the floor of the temporal horn, there is the collateral eminence. And this is the lateral wall formed by the tapetum of the corpus callosum. This is to show you, remind you, that the amygdala is in the roof of the temporal horn, the tail of the caudate, and going anteriorly to form the head of the caudate, joining the lentiform nucleus. This is another view showing the amygdala, tail, body, and head of the caudate joining 
the putamen. The occipital hole, occipital hole has got a roof, a lateral wall, and the floor, all formed by the tapetum of the corpus callosa, and the medial wall, as we saw, has a bulb, and it's called the calcar avis. And this is, as you see, the lateral wall is made of the tapetum of the occipital hole, medially is made by the forceps major, here is the forceps minor, and the optic radiation is lateral to it on its way to the occipital lobe. Uh, the endoscopic anatomy is also very important because we do a lot of endoscopy as neurosurgeons in the lateral ventricle, so we have to know the anatomy. When you pass into the frontally in the frontal horn, you will find the foramen of Monroe, you will find the choroid plexus coming from lateral to medial, going into the roof of the third ventricle, you will find the thalamus right vein joining the anterior septal vein, forming the start of the internal cerebral veins which are present on the roof of the third ventricle, and this is called the venous angle. After we enter with the endoscope from the foramen of Monroe, so we go through the lateral ventricle, foramen of Monroe, you will find the floor of the third ventricle, which will be discussed in detail with the third ventricle, and you find here the mammillary bodies and a transparent structure, which is the tubular region, the tuber scenario, and where we do our lesion, we do our uh, uh, opening in this thin membrane, where we do the ETV, the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Uh, another thing to be said, there are different approaches to the lateral ventricle according to where is the lesion in which hole, so we can approach the frontal hole by the anterior frontal approach, middle frontal gyrus, or from anterior transcalosal. And you can reach the body by the transcalosal or posterior parietal, and posterior part by posterior transcalosal. Occipital horn, you can reach it by the occipital approach, and the temporal horn, you can reach it by anterior temporal or the temporal approach. Thank you very much. We hope to meet soon again. And I hope that this was a concise uh, talk about the anatomy of the lateral ventricle.